So, of course, a pleasure uh, to be here today and see so many uh, of you. As you know, as Gus just mentioned, the OECD has been uh, very keen to accompany and actually initiate some of the work on well-being. And as Gus said, and as our Deputy Secretary General will um, recall again this afternoon, as our Secretary General Angel Gurria, um, in his re-election, has just been reappointed for five years, he produced a manifesto which is called 21 for 21 because his term will end in 2021 and he came up with 21 propositions and there is a chapeau over all this which starts that our main vision and our main objective is to improve the well-being of people and then the rest goes um, as um, so I think that's a great testimony that the uh, the OECD is really um, keen and will devote most of its energy to actually um, deliver on its vision. But I think, ladies and gentlemen, we are really uh, turning a corner um, in our understanding of happiness in our, and in our ability to measure it. As uh, Gus mentioned, um, back in 2011, and that's when I think um, we started earlier at the OECD on well-being, but in 2011, when we celebrated our 50th anniversary of the organization, we published a first report, our first report on uh, indicators showing, demonstrating the evidence on well-being entitled How's Life. And since then, as I just mentioned, we've constantly consistently put people's well-being at the center of our work and our policy advice. In 2013, we wrote guidelines on, uh, for national statistical offices on how to measure subjective well-being. And in almost, I'm very pleased to report that in almost every OECD country nowadays, national statistical offices have actually started to include these measures in their regular surveys which means that we can actually draw on sound evidence. But to inform policy, or actually to make policies, we must go beyond the measurement, and that's what Gus uh, mentioned. We must also understand what are the drivers of well-being over time, and identify those key moments when policy can have the greatest impact on how people experience their lives. That is what we are going to be talking about today. In some policy circles, at the moment, there is ongoing discussion about perceptions versus reality. Just over a week ago, uh, and Andrew uh, was there with us, uh, we organized a conference hosted at the OECD exploring the theme of the squeezed middle class, a close cousin, I understand, of the UK's just about managing, or jams. People who are only just managing to get by, and those who feel it will get more difficult um, for people like them and their children in the future. It can be tempted to put perceptions in juxtaposition with the facts, the so-called hard evidence, on which policymakers have traditionally relied upon. But as one of the speakers at the conference pointed out, perceptions cannot be wrong in themselves. They can sometimes uh, exhibit unexpected relationships with some of the data that we, the experts, might choose to focus on. But who are we to tell people that their feelings are wrong? Of course, there can be measurement errors, and we must design our data collections very carefully to minimize such errors, but to dismiss people's views as wrong simply because we don't, do not understand them will be very arrogant indeed, to say the least. And so it is, too, with subjective well-being. For a long time, economists have given this data a wide berth. They didn't always make sense, particularly in relation to income, and that was a major cause of concern. Yet. The goal of asking people about their satisfactions with life is to understand whether people feel able to live the lives that they value. For most people, income provides an essential means and resource uh, to uh, live the lives that they, they want. Uh, but uh, to some extent, uh, that helps them, the income helps them realize some of the goals they want to achieve, but it's far from being the whole picture. 
And while income is going up, other things can be going down. And I think the book uh, from Richard and Andrew and others will uh, demonstrate that very well. We ignore people's feelings about their lives at our own peril. If we only consider GDP growth in the run-up to the Arab Spring, the economies of Egypt and Tunisia would have seemed reasonable, reasonably healthy, but when we look at subjective well-being over that same period, we get a very different picture, one of growing concern and fewer people thriving by their own standards. In such a context, it makes, um, in, in some, in some, it makes absolutely no sense to talk about perceptions versus reality. Both GDP and subjective well-being tell us something about what's happening in the country, but certainly not necessarily the same thing. And it's important to understand how both of them evolve over time. Over the next two days, you will hear some very exciting new evidence about the key drivers of subjective well-being over the life course. This kind of information is absolutely critical if we want policymakers to uh, take the topic of well-being very seriously. Because they, this uh, perspective over the life course, allows us to throw lights on which are the levers that they can pull and when in order to make a difference. Some commentators have argued that the keys to happiness lie somewhere outside the legitimate realms of public policy. I'm sure nobody in this room believes that, but that's what we hear sometimes in the depth of individual personality and that my mysterious home life in which government shall not interfere. Yet so many of the core drivers of happiness are found in areas fundamentally, fundamentally affected by policy, from income to health, from employment to how people spend their time, and so on. If the goal is to enable people to live the life that they value the most, then at the bare minimum, it is essential to be sure that policy in these areas isn't harming people's ability to do this. And in the best case scenario, we'd be doing much better than that. We'd be using these key levers of government to maximize gains to well-being. A lot of how all this will be achieved will be in the specifics. How would school curricula or the broader school environment need to change? if well-being was taken as a serious objective alongside children's connect, connect, cognitive development. I want to say, I mean, I've, I very much agree with what Gus just mentioned about education. It just as a piece of information, um, when we try to measure uh, uh, children's achievement in, term, in terms of cognitive skills, as you are well aware, the PISA tests are, that we just released actually last week are very well known. But we are now introducing questions in PISA about the emotional skills of the children and about the well-being of children in the school. And this will be, in the next waves of PISA, we will have this. So we can also try to measure those other aspects of the life of children at school. And how, and then link this up with their cognitive skills, just to answer the sort of question that you, you you um, alluded to, Gus, which is do people, do children with uh, better emotional skills and well-being uh, perform better also in cognitive um, skills? So um, I, I hope that in the years to come, of course, PISA, as you know, is a, is a, is a test that is only conducted every uh, three years. So it will take some time to analyze the results, but the next PISA way will have these questions included in the tests. So how would healthcare spending and delivery need to change if people's mental health was to be uh, given the same priority as their physical health? How can we provide, provide the best possible support to people looking for work, mindful of the psychological impact that unemployment and job search has on the people who are already vulnerable in the material sense of the, of the word? So all these questions hopefully will get some answers today and uh, tomorrow. And uh, we have uh, gathered experts um, for today, but also for those of you who will participate in the seminar tomorrow, uh, we'll, we'll um, try to explore this, um, these questions uh, in more uh, depth. So um, before all that, however, we are going to hear from the team 
uh, behind a brand new book, one that promises to reveal the origins of happiness. This is very important work, as I will say when I uh, act as a discussant in, in a few minutes, but, uh, and so I don't want to take uh, more time to, to talk about it now. But I, so I will close by saying that it's really a pleasure, again, to be here, and I want to thank you for joining us on behalf of the OECD, of course, of the London School of Economics, the Wellbeing Observatory of the Paris Schools of Economics, and of course, we wouldn't be here uh, today without the generous support of the uh, World Work Center for Wellbeing, uh, who will hopefully be in the position to help translate all the findings of today and tomorrow into policy action. So we look forward to very good discussions and thank you very much. <laughs>